we are in a series studying through 1 Thessalonians, really enjoy actually studying through books. Um, what Paul has written so far, before we jump into the text, is basically his thankfulness to the brethren there, their labor of love, their, their work of faith, their steadfast hope. He is mindful that they were an example to all of those living in their area and beyond. Others heard the word of God from them, and they heard about how they actually changed their lives from serving idols to the living God. And then Paul reflects on his time with them. He is thankful how they received the word of God as being just that, the word of God, not the word that comes and originates from mankind, but from God. And the power that was with uh, the work that was within them, the word in them. And he is reminiscing about his time with them, how he was like a gentle mo mother, did not seek to burden them, uh, and how he was a father to them and exhorted them, and how he longs to see them face to face. And that's where we're at in First Thessalonians. Right? Let me read verse 17 to complete this thought. I'm in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 17. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavor the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown or boasting there of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory Enjoy. I think that one day, whenever Jesus Christ returns, yes, we're going to know and see each other. And, and Paul says, Amen. Because, like, whenever I see you, uh, you're going to be part of the gift of heaven. So, here's what I want to do chapter three is not long, 13 verses. I want to walk through this with you. I want to give some comments as we go along. And then there's something in particular that I wanted to draw attention to. I want to share some thoughts that I had. So let's get into it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Again, he was longing to see them, wanted to see them face to face, but Satan had hindered him from doing so. Therefore, verse 1, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker, in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith, that no one may be moved by these afflictions. Let me do a pause really quickly, because again, as we're studying through these, I don't want to get too technical, but I do want to answer some of these perplexing passages. Why is this perplexing? He's simply saying that he was willing to be left alone at, at Athens and send Timothy to those in Thessalonica. Here's what's kind of tricky about this. Look at Acts 17 with me. Acts 17, we know that Paul and Silas are in Thessalonica. We know that they send Paul away into Berea. We find out that not only is Silas with him, but Timothy is as well. Why? Because look in verse 14. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. So even though the text doesn't talk about Timothy being in Thessalonica, we start to connect dots. He was there, and then he traveled to Berea. They're sending Paul off to Athens but Silas and Timothy stay in, brothers, where? Berea. Okay? Verse thir uh, 15, those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a, a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. He wants Paul, uh, excuse me, Timothy and Silas to come to him in Athens. Well, we get into the text in Athens, we don't read about Timothy and Silas doesn't necessarily mean, any, mean, mean anything, but here's what's interesting. Then he travels to Corinth. Now I'm in chapter 18, that is Paul. And look at verse 5. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. So I just wanted to cover this because you're, in, you're reading uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, and he talks about being willing to be left alone in Athens, and so he sends Timothy, but it looks like Timothy wasn't in Athens, that he joins him in Corinth. So let me just say this and I'll move on because you're going to forget about this tomorrow morning. 
So either what we have is that they didn't make it to Corinth, I mean to Athens, and they ended up going from Berea straight to Corinth. And so when he says, we were willing to be left alone, but we sent Timothy, it just means that he, he sent instruction from Timothy to go from Berea to Corinth. Or what it means is that they actually were with them in Athens. But he really wanted to know how they were doing, and he sent him back to Thessalonica from Macedonia, and then they met him in Corinth. I can tell by your faces that you're very thankful for this information. <laughs> you're welcome. Now look, verse 3. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. He's talking about afflictions. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass, and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Brethren, I want to encourage you with something, if you would join me in this, that we, we need to be observant Bible students. And that may sound offensive, but here's where I'm coming from. Many times, whenever we're talking about the Bible, we get into the weeds and we get very technical. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not opposed to, to, to looking at the technical side of the word. I just went through something you probably didn't care about. I mean, this morning's uh, class is about, it's getting into the technical aspect. But can I, can I just sh share with me this observation? Whenever you're reading, for example, the New Testament, it does not come across feeling technical. It's not one technical, perplexing discussion after one another. Matter of fact, a lot of it has to do with like what you're reading. And this is meat. This is not milk. Here's what I'm trying to say. At the end of the day, Paul, as brilliant as he was, was not divorced from reality. And here's his thoughts. You know what? I know what it's like in life to hear the gospel. I know what it's like to be driven by emotion. And emotion in and of itself is not bad. But the thing is, is I left these babes in Christ in Thessalonica. I left them there, and they're going to suffer. And they are going to be punished. They are going to be persecuted. And I am super afraid, listen to this. Let me, let me read verse 4 and 5. For when we were with you, we kept telling you again before that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass. And just as you know, for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Paul realized, I know what it's like to be under pressure. And people cave. In fact, Paul could tell you, I used to put on the pressure. Whenever I persecuted the way, I would try to get an individual to blaspheme the name Jesus, to blaspheme the way. I've seen in my life people that are all excited about doing something, and then reality kicks in. That's why we fail at our New Year's resolution. You know, it's like, I'm going to do this. We're like, I believe that you feel like doing it. <laughs> but then reality sets in, and you're like, I didn't think this all the way through. But i got to level with you for a moment. Our challenge in the West in 2022 is not Satan getting us because we're so heavily persecuted. When, whenever, whenever your complaint of persecution is people say bad things about Christians here in the West. Really? That kind of puts things into perspective. It may get rough one day, but we're not there yet. As your brother in Christ... Let me quickly remind us, and then I'll move on. Our challenge, how Satan gets us, is not through suffering. Our challenge is that we hear the good news, and we're all in, and then we just go back to our way of living, or bad habits, or things that would appeal to the flesh. And here's the scary thing. The things may not even be bad in of themselves, but they become our gods. Can I kindly remind us today, this is what I think we need to hear. We are cush. We, we forget what it feels like to be convicted. We, we forget what it was like 
whenever we we decided, you know what, I'm seeing the behavior of the world and the things that they take part in, their entertainment, what makes them laugh. And that didn't, there was a point where I wasn't laughing at it anymore. There was a point where I was actually put off by things of the world. It, it no longer left a good taste in my mouth. And, and somewhere along the line, I fell back into that again. And we lose our conviction. And I think where Satan gets us is he says, you know what, you'll get to that later. But in the reality, as the Hebrew writer warns in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, is that we go on thinking we'll get to it and sharpen up later, but our heart grows hard. So let's, let's be careful about that. But there's something else that, that i got to pay attention to. And brethren, that is the, the love that Paul had for his brother. And this again is another big picture realization. This is what the Bible talks a lot about. And we would be wise to take note of this. I have a very simple question for you. When is the last time you've been super concerned about the spiritual well-being of those around you? Listen, I, I don't know where Timothy was at, but here's what I do know. Paul says, I'm willing to give up Timothy. Whether that meant that Timothy was going to come to him or was with him, it matters not. The point is, I'm willing to give up that source of encouragement and give it to you because I'm concerned. Brethren, if we don't spend time with one another, if we're not connected with one another, how do we know what we're going through? And if we don't spend time with one another, not only do we not know what we're going through, where do you think all of a sudden you're just going to draw that desire to care about your brother? What I'm seeing in the New Testament is that this is the kind of stuff that it focuses in on. And I want to try to be like Paul, but we're not done. But now, verse 6, but now that Timothy has come to us from you, and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day, that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. I'm not trying to pick on you, but i got to tell you anymore, if I'm going to get bold, I'm going to get bold in this area. It's easy to tell you, don't commit adultery, okay? Don't worship idols, okay? Don't kill anybody, okay? Be kind, okay? But this, it's just not doing it. I, I, think, we're, I think we're just, we're, we got the gloves on. When is the last time, now really think about this, don't say it out loud. Whenever I just read through those passages, for example, did that resonate? Or did it seem like, eh? We struggle in the church. What is our struggle? I can tell you as a minister some of the key struggles that I see in the church. One of them is that we're driven by fear. We do not feel confident in our salvation. That's a different sermon. We struggle with the concept of the grace, grace of God. Here's another issue that we have. We do not feel connected. We struggle with lukewarmness. But my fear is that the answer to that, we keep pushing off for some reason. I don't feel connected. We'll get connected. See, we're, we're, we're in this difficult thing because there's a thing that we want, but we're not ready to give up what we want. I want to feel connected, yet you want your independence. I want to feel like people care about me, yet you don't sacrifice time for anyone. I want to feel like a family, yet you don't act like a family. Now, now he, hear this, and don't only hear it, but feel it. Paul says, here's what I'm saying. 
Timothy has now come back to me. And I am so very thankful because even though I'm being persecuted and I'm suffering, here's what I'm saying. I'm hearing that you're doing well in your faith and you think well of us. So what I'm hearing is that you're growing in faith and so today I live. Can I challenge us? Here's the thing. I get it. I'm like you. I don't like being told that there's an area of weakness, but I also kind of love it whenever a brother or sister in Christ points it out to me lovingly. You know what I mean? I love it. Those are the people that I go to. You want to know why I also love them? Because those are the people that go to the spiritual gym with me. I, I choose people that are better than me to work out with me. It's awkward because they'll say, okay, that's not even remotely close how you lift a dumbbell. I'm like, cool, cool, cool. But they show me where I'm messing up. And then when I start up in the weight on the dumbbells and the spiritual gym, if you will, they're also the people that are saying, excellent job. And they are rejoicing with me. Brethren, in the body, not only do we need to act like family, we need to be helping each other. I need to know that I have people that are concerned for my well-being, and I also need people that rejoice with me. Brethren, here's a very simple question. When is the last time that you have rejoiced at the spiritual growth of the well-being of your brother or sister? When is the last time? Now, honestly, not to say this because it sounds good, but that you actually looked at your life and you said, I'm actually suffering right now, but I found out that so-and-so had this victory in their life spiritually, and I am on cloud nine. We are, we are dehydrated many times in the body. And this is what we're lacking. I have another question. When is the last time you have stopped and you have prayed with a brother or sister on the spot? You know, it's interesting in this letter. It starts with the prayer. It transitions with the prayer. It ends with the prayer. Here's his prayer, verse 11. Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all His saints. Now, listen, we're going to get into this coming. You've noticed now He keeps talking about Jesus. Where is Jesus in all of this? Oh, He's coming. <laughs> He's coming. And Paul's going to give special attention to that. But there is His prayer. Now, here's what happened this week as I was going through it. I've got just a few more minutes. Give me about five more minutes, and then I'm, I'm done with my thoughts for this morning. So one of the other things that I'm trying to, to be better about as I read through these accounts is not reading over what just may be given, just details. There, there, there's a reason. There's something about it. You know, like, you remember that first time you had a realization you were studying in the Old or New Testament? And you realize that there had been maybe a gap of like 15 years between like chapter 6 and chapter 7. <laughs> You're like, oh, man, I didn't even realize that. You just read it through so quickly. But in this next chapter, like 15 years has gone by. And you have that moment where you just begin to look at that person's life and think about what, what would that have been for them? I think that is such good Bible study. Can we do that for just a moment? I started thinking about Timothy. If I were Timothy, what would I say to you? You know, well, hey, this, is, this is interesting. You're reading through my life. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is interesting. This was a really interesting spot for my life. As you know, you know Paul had come, come through Lystra at some point, and you've read now that my, my mother and my grandmother obeyed the gospel. That's right. Uh, maybe it was Paul who, who introduced them. Timothy would be able to tell you about that. But yeah, my, my, my father was not a believer, but, but this really resonated with me. And I was convicted, and I obeyed the gospel as well. And then as you read, yeah, Paul came back 
to Lystra, and he invited me to travel with him. And, and I was a young man. I was about like in my mid-30s. And, and this Paul, whom we had known and heard about, an apostle, invited me. And it was, it was a game changer. It changed my life. I started traveling with this man. I left everything that I was familiar with. I left mom and grandma. Um, I left everything I was familiar with. And there I was walking with this man. And I've never seen anyone like him before in my life. In many ways. I mean, the power that God was doing through him to see the miracles that he was performing. Yeah, it was a blockbuster. Um, to, to see a man that was so brilliant and so knowledgeable was incredible. To see a guy that was so tenacious. When we talk about being, you know, suffering for the cause, there's just not a town that he wouldn't go into. But yeah, what was interesting about what you're reading today is that I was so used to having Paul beside me. But I got left behind, and then he told me to go to Thessalonica on my own. I, I did not have Paul with me this time. And you know, I... I got to thinking about our young brothers and sisters and the changes of life that they're going through. You know, whether that's leaving for school, whether that's entering into marriage. And it's, it's like, it, it's not totally new. I mean, Timothy at this point was accustomed to spreading the gospel. But he didn't have mom and pops with him anymore, if you will. You know, think about that for a moment. And I was also thinking about our parents and trying to, because I'm not at your stage yet. You know, our, our kids are still, the oldest is only 11. And I'm thinking about what that's got to be like for you to send Timothy away, if you will. I don't mean this in a bad way, but you, I mean, I'm, not, I'm saying something you already know. So the work's put in. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's too late now, right? You're, you're sending them off. You've put the work in. And you, you want them to be like a Timothy, and, and for my younger brothers and sisters, listen up. Your physical mother and father or your spiritual mother and fathers love you and pull for you, and they have the confidence in the letting you go, but it's nerve-wracking. How, how will they do? Do you think that Timothy thought about being alone? Sure. Do you think that Timothy, realizing the freedom that he was going to have, now think about this, Timothy was, would also have freedom. He didn't have Paul protecting him, true, but he also didn't have Paul on his back. Now, do you think that Timothy would have gone back to Thessalonica saying, time to party? No. Do, do any of you really think he, that was, a t probably not. But see, it's because the work had already been done, put in, that Timothy was like that. Young brothers and sisters, whatever it is that you're transitioning into, know this, that God, your Father, has equipped you. It's all right to be scary. But give great thought about the freedom that you're about to have. God will use it to His glory. Satan will wreck you with it. My hope is, the reality is, is that you're not having to mess with this because your mind is already made up. Hey, new setting, some changes, but business as always. I'm going to school. I've been in school for 12 years. If you're not, and as you're thinking about this, you're kind of nervous about the decisions you think that you're going to make, would you please reach out to one of us afterwards <laughs> so we can talk about that? But the last thing I want to say, and, and I appreciate your attention, and this, this sermon is yours. I, I want to build you up and remind you of who you are. You're a child of God. And while we are always being helped by others, there's a beautiful thing that happens in life whenever you transition from being the one that's always helped to where you now become the helper. So whether you're going into college 
whether you're starting a new marriage and starting your own family, your own unit, now is the time to realize the work of God in you. And it's time to start helping people more and more. Amen? Let's not be a hindrance. Let's be a helper. And may God bless you as you do that.